I'd like to start off by asking um, Mr. Fairbrush um, sort of a basic question, I guess. And uh, Oklahoma is not, in general, Oklahoma City as well, is not they're not necessarily a shining star of mass transit nationally. And I th I'd say in some people's minds, transit is a chicken or egg proposition. I if you build it, will they ride? Or is it more of a matter of if they start riding more, if we can convince them to ride more, then we can go ahead and fund it and build it. So my question is, will many more Oklahomans want to give up their cars and ride the bus or train? And if so, what evidence do you see now that they will do so? Well, I think um, it's a good question, and I would say optimistically that yes, I think a lot of Oklahomans, uh, particularly those in the Oklahoma City metro area, are, are definitely ready to begin using local bus service and utilizing uh, the potential of, of trains in the future. And the reason I say that is because I think when you look within our community, there is a lot of momentum for public transportation uh, in the Oklahoma City area. You know, when we look at the events of December 1st, where six mayors came together to sign a uh, memorandum of understanding to develop a task force to look at regional transit. Um, we look at events like this, o Oklahoma Watch and what they've put together, and here we are on a Tuesday evening and we have a crowded room full of interested people in transit. Um, and then we look at the data, okay? The data will back up, in my opinion, what, what I seem to think is certainly um, uh, more people interested in using local bus. And I say that because since implementing some of our uh, enhancements to our local bus system, back in 2014, um, we've looked at the data and after, after a year of having those enhancements in place on our fixed route bus system, we've seen about a 9.5% increase in passenger trips. And so that tells me, yes, there are new, there are people using our bus system now that, that haven't used it before. And I think we're going to see that same trend when we look at the modern streetcar and in, in the distant future with, with rail as well. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, as, as he mentioned, the six mayors have signed an agreement to develop a regional transit authority. What, um, I guess in very practical terms, why is it so necessary that we have this regional authority? And, and why these cities? Great. Hey, thank you for, being, for having this forum. We're glad to be here, David. Um, you know, a couple of things, I mean, really to just give some context as far as what this MOU is, uh, six cities coming together, really um, ACOG, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, along with many multiple partners, or partners at Embark, or partners with other transit authorities, uh, here in the region, CART, Norman, City Link, and Edmond, six cities including Oklahoma City, Edmond, Norman, uh, Dell City, Midwest City, Moore, have all been really talking, uh, really at a high level since 2009. And as you know, and as you travel, if you travel here in the metro, you know that transportation does not stop at city limits. Um, that many of you may have traveled across multiple jurisdictions, whether you knew it or not. And if you look across the region, um, look across the region, we're having significant growth. Um, transportation, Choices and, and trips take us into multiple jurisdictions, jobs, school, where you live, where you, where you, uh, where you shop. They may be in multiple, multiple locations. So it's been a very important discussion, I think really elevated between multiple cities, multiple stakeholders, the business community to begin looking at this at a higher, kind of a regional level. Um, for those of you who are familiar with systems across the nation, they're typically tackled at a regional level, that um, you know, city, city growth doesn't stop at city limits, city streets don't stop at city limits, and so it's very important to find kind of a, a transit solution, a long-term one, to help our, help our region grow and continue to thrive and to keep our great quality of life. Um, our region, you know, we've seen just really historic growth in the last decade. The last decade, uh, we saw about a 15% population growth here. It's a very significant number. Many of you who drive around, walk around, travel around, you're probably noticing some congestion. You're noticing new license plates. You're noticing new, new pockets of activity. 
And we fully expect and are projecting more of that to come. We're expecting another uh, almost half million people coming in the next 25 years. This is a regional uh, need. And really, I think, you know, the regional cooperation is just a, a very important step because that's how this advances. Um, and that's how many other regions across the nation have done. And, and now um, this commitment from these other cities is, is very important for us going forward. So, good question. So, uh, Ms. Branch, uh, just the other day, someone posted uh, in one of our stories announcing the forum that uh, a woman from Dallas made a post saying that she had a son who was blind and that they are from Oklahoma and they would love to move back to Oklahoma City. But because the transit system here is so underdeveloped, there was no way that they could bring their son back to Oklahoma because they need the extensive transit system you find in the DFW area. So. My question for you is, how, how would you describe our current status in terms of the extent of our system and what it means for people? So I've been involved with our organization for almost 20 years. And so um, over the last 20 years, we have seen a lot of improvements in, um, in our system here and, and seen some initiatives to expand service. I know that Jason mentioned in 2014 that, um, that there was some investment made by our city to do some expanded routes and, and um, expanded night service, which certainly has helped. But regardless, the Oklahoma City area is still per capita one of the lowest funded transit systems in the country. If you go to, um, to sister cities of our size, they put, they put way more money into transit than, than we ever think of doing that. And so, you know, given the population that we work with, we are constantly challenged um, for our, our, um, the, our constituents to be integrated into our communities the way that, that we all want to be integrated in our, our communities. And that not only means ability to get to and from work, which is, always a, which is always a challenge. I mean, it seems like we've made some improvements, but, you know, there's a lot of transit that gets to people's, you know, where people live, but it doesn't necessarily have the connectivity between where they live and, and where they work, which is, is really what um, a robust transit system would do, but the fact that um, the fact that we have limited service on weekends, we have have limited service at night, really um, impacts people's ability to um, to access the wonderful things that we have here in Oklahoma. And I know that you know I've heard the um, heard our mayor, Mayor Cornett, speak over and over again about Oklahoma City and being a world class city. In order to, in, in my opinion, in order to really reach that pinnacle of being a world-class city, it, we, we have got to have a robust transit system. And I think that the streetcar is a, um, is, is a good start investment in terms of, of um, you know, having something other, other than the bus system. But we all have to recognize that any really good transit system, the infrastructure is the, is the rubber tires. And... Um, I think until we commit as a community through our regional transit um, program to invest as a community, and, and I think that that means a dedicated funding source, that we're never going to be able to address the issues and provide a transit system that would work for someone like that lady's son who is blind and we hear over and over again that people don't move to our communities because of our lack of transportation and it's not just people who are disabled but it's it's the young professionals who really view that component of a community as a quality of life issue and um and, and i gotta tell you i mean i really am thrilled to see that um, that we are taking some steps forward but we have a long way to go so what are some of the experiences that transit bus, bus riders have now in terms of getting to the airport or getting to to their job or the doctor? What, what have you heard? Um, well, I don't believe there's a route to the airport yet. Am I correct, Jason? 
That is correct. That is correct. So getting to the airport, you have to take um, private transportation. Um, getting to work is a challenge. I'm glad to see Midwest City involved in this. We have, um, our organization has contracts at Tinker Air Force Base. We have a hard time filling positions at Tinker Air Force Base because we don't have good transit, consistent, um, efficient transit to get people out there. The, um, the doctor issue, medical issues are always a problem, getting to the grocery stores. Uh, we've even had, um, you know, I, I saw one of my friends out here who is working with a nonprofit agency to develop a supplemental transit system for seniors and people with vision impairments because it's such a problem here to develop something outside of our mass, uh, mass transit system. It's a problem that we see every day. And I want to mention, too, it's not just the bus transit when you have routes. Oklahoma City was built, and, and you guys know this, we are built without sidewalks. And so transit isn't accessible if you can't get to the bus stops, right? And so I know we're making some investments in that, but it's, it's very difficult to walk in the street, to, to ride a wheelchair in the street, to not have curb cutouts, to get to the bus stops, to not have bus shelters, nice bus shelters in all the places. And, and I see Jason shaking his head, and I know that, that uh, the city of Oklahoma City has a commitment to that, but, but those are some of the areas that we still see as problematic that we're just not quite there yet. Uh, Mr. Fairbrush, you've added some services. There have been some improvements. What else is coming, and what's on your wish list? Well, i um, like to talk yeah, a little bit about the, the enhancements that we've made and what, we've, you know, what we plan, plan to, to implement in the future. And, and really, it all goes back to that transit system analysis. That is uh, the plan that we are working, the plan that we are um, implementing, and it's that plan that gives us guidance over the next two to three years in terms of what's next. So we've added a lot of frequency. Almost all of our routes are now on 30-minute uh, frequencies. Um, we've uh, made the, the, the routes themselves a lot more uh, direct. The system is e easier to understand, more predictable. Um, we have made a lot of improvements in terms of um, adding additional bus shelters. So I'm saying all of that will continue. And then the next phase of that is, you know, one of the things we're really excited about was the night service that we launched um, last January. It's the first time we've had fixed route bus service until midnight in Oklahoma City in, I'm just going to say, several decades. Um, and we've had really good success with those two routes that we're running until midnight. We're going to launch um, two more uh, evening routes this January, Route 5 and Route 13, serving both the north and the south side of Oklahoma City. And so we're looking forward to that. So going out even further, like looking at the next three to five year time frame, we want to continue to improve um, our bus stops. And, you know, right now we have, we have installed about 38 uh, new bus stops um, across the system with plans by the end of the fiscal year to, to finish out a total of 45. We actually have 106 locations across the city that we're looking at and improving whether it's a bus shelter, whether it's a curb cut, whether it's a, side, uh, a, uh, a sidewalk that provides a connector. So we want to keep doing a lot of that. Um, and then we want to continue to work our plan, and that is hopefully we'll have an opportunity to further expand our night service. Um, we want to bring online some form of Sunday service. We know that is certainly needed. Um, we want to continue to add high frequency corridors. Right now we have two 15 minute corridors in our system. We would, we would really like to expand that. Frequency again is a, is a key to a successful public transit system. And we want to continue to leverage our, our rebranding and, and just educate the public about the benefits of public transportation and the fact that we believe, although we still have a long way to go, we certainly are a different system, a better system than what we were even five or ten years ago due to the leadership of the City Council, the COTPA Board of Trustees, and, and various organizations that have helped us get here. A quick question for you. Um, uh, tra traditionally, as I mentioned, transit riders have been lower income, often the working poor. They, they're so dependent on transportation. But when a system really starts to expand and grow, there's buy-in from higher income workers. And yet there's this perception, again, that riding buses, riding transit, there's something rough around the edges, there may be a concern about safety, right or wrong. What are you going to do to try and convince people that 
It's okay for anyone to ride transit or buses in Oklahoma City. Yeah, well, I think we have to, we have to continue our, our marketing and our branding and letting the community know what Embark is all about. And you're right, we do, um, for example, one of the things we do is we do surveys. We conduct surveys of the community, we conduct surveys of our customer base because we want to know about those things. What is keeping people using our service or what's preventing people from trying it? And a lot of times we do hear that. Well, you know, it just takes longer to use transit. I'd, I'd rather drive. Well, you know, with 30 minute frequencies, it's still probably going to take you a little bit longer to, to ride the bus than it is to drive, but there's a lot of opportunity to use that time more wisely. That's what I suggest to people. So again, with 30 minute frequency, if your commute time is 10 or 15 minutes more because you're riding the bus, but you know you have uh, uh, the accessibility of uh, free Wi-Fi and, and just a better use of that time while you're on that bus, hopefully that'll attract some of those folks that haven't had an opportunity to use our local bus system yet. Um, in addition to that, you know, again, going back to some of the, the things that, that we ask people, why don't you ride the bus? We do hear that. Well, you know, maybe the buses are, are dirty. I'm not sure. Well, you know, when our latest survey results, our customers indicated 70, 75% of our customer base said our buses are very clean. There, the safety issue comes up. People are just, you know, I've never used transit. I don't know how safe it is. Again, 85% of our customer base says the, the bus is a, is a very uh, safe mode of transportation. So, you know, part of it is, is just getting out into that community and I think continuing to educate and, um, and really be able to uh, uh, leverage some of the, the new technology. I think that's going to be able to attract people to the bus system that maybe haven't used it before and so forth. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, we have a long-term plan. It includes commuter rail going north, going south, going east. We have bus rapid transit on the west side. We have improved bus systems. Are we on track with this plan, setting funding aside, and uh, why these components? I mean, it doesn't have light rail. Right. Uh, I don't know how many express buses it has. Some cities have these nice greyhound-like express buses. Is this, uh, how does this plan look now? Sure. Um, really to provide a little bit of context, I think where, where the plans are, the plans are not refined, they're not in their complete, this is the plan, this is the system going forward. But really, I think, and just to take you back a little bit, I mean, this has been a discussion and lots of concerted attempts really over the last decade. 2005, COPPA developed a, its long-range transportation plan. It was a regional plan, it's called, many of you might know it, it's called the COPPA Fixed Guideway Study. I believe it has 11 regional corridors, including north to Edmond, south to Norman, a connection out to Midwest City to Tinker, Northwest Expressway, service to the airport, different BRT, and that recommended various modes, um, really looking out, I want to say 2030, 2030 area. Um, so with that, that plan has really helped our region uh, develop more detailed analysis. So we have done more detailed analysis looking north to Edmond, south to Norman with the commuter rail, streetcar connection out to Midwest City. It's not complete, and when you look around the nation, um, and we've looked at lots of different regions, lots of different transit authorities, um, a very strong uh, bus network is essential. Even Denver, many of you might be in Denver and you know how they have rail running everywhere, they're going out to the airport. 80% of the trips in Denver are made by bus. Um, so it's a the bus network is a very significant component. We're really looking at additional planning and that's really the next steps to try to devise um, a very robust plan, a very complete plan, a very com uh, connected plan that looks at all modes and that tries to match the mode to the service area. Some modes work better uh, depending on the land use and the traffic capabilities and others. I mean, that's really the decision between streetcar and another one. So it's really trying to identify that and come up with an implementation plan. These things take time. Uh, they take lots of planning, lots of funding, um, but there are gradual steps, I think, that we can continue to take forward. Um, and the more, you know, look for us really at the regional level to still talk about that, define that plan, get more inputs, public input ideas as far as what that should look like and to develop it. But we have a start um, and uh, we'll see where that goes. So, yeah. 
One question, and anyone can pick up this answer, just about cost before I turn it over to the audience. Um, all transit is subsidized. Yeah. And, um, but what do you say to people who oppose um, expensive rail systems and transit in general who complain of government subsidies? What, what's your response to them? Go ahead. I'll take a stab, yeah. Um, well, it's, if you want, and you're looking for a regional transit system like you've seen in other communities, whether it's Dallas or Denver or Salt Lake or, or New York, you have to realize that um, those systems are being basically built largely with federal dollars. Federal dollars are dedicated uh, they're available for basically the capital expenses. If we're talking about the purchase of vehicles, the, the vehicles that Embark has in its system, 80% of that is being funded typically by federal grants. Anything that's capital, um, the federal government has a hand in helping basically regions develop. Um, so those are very important. Um, we as a region are missing out. Uh, we, you know, that these developments, and if, as you've traveled, you've seen transit be, whether it's light rail or commuter rail, BRT, other modes being developed in other communities, other communities and regions that we compete with for jobs, for status, for economic vitality, for quality of life. Um, so there's no reason that Central Oklahoma shouldn't have a piece of that pie. I think the other misnomer that's out there, transit does not pay for itself. I mean, that is true. It is a publicly... A supported entity. Typically the rule is that federal money pays for the capital expenses, so the purchase of the buses, the purchase of the rail, building that out, there's usually anywhere between 50 to 80 percent available for that, but what the federal government looks to is the regions to spend and, and dedicate uh, funding to support operations. Operations is the service on the street. Operations is how often you run buses. It's how late you go. It's where you go. How large of a system you can have. And those are really the local decisions. So it's both, uh, the federal money can be, it's there. It can be leveraged, um, but the leverage really takes a local commitment both um, for planning, but also for that financial piece that, yes, if we get this, we can run it and we'll run it well. So. I could, I could add ahead. something quickly to that. Maybe an, an, another perspective is, you know, if I'm in conversations, um, of course it depends on the, the audience that we're, you know, talking to. But I think in particular, um, when you talk about um, subsidies or tax dollars to construct, you know, fixed guideways, particularly rail, I think it's important to remind people um, and, and give them examples of areas in the country where um, although the fixed guideway or the rail line may not pay for itself, look around that fixed guideway. What kind of economic development has occurred? What has happened to property values? Have areas been revitalized because of the fact that there's now a permanent transit system in place? So, so I think that's part of the conversation as well. And then, you know, for those that say, well, you know, I, I'll probably never use the bus service or the rail service. I'm not sure why we're why we're funding that at certain levels, you know, I try to remind them that, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the community. And so, um, you know, maybe perhaps let's say a, a business owner may, may not necessarily use the, the transit system on a regular basis, but maybe uh, the people that work there do. And so I just, you know, try to remind people that it's, it's really part of the community as a whole. And, and as we've heard, having a robust transit system um, adds, adds to that community. Uh, I'd like to open it to questions from the audience. We have two people with microphones, so raise your hand if you'd like to pose a question. Um, with record low uh, gas prices, what's the possibility of having uh, a gas tax, whether it be a certain percentage or more for transit, but also for uh, the regional transit authority? At, a, at, this, at the city level it? or at the you know, regional level? Can the city even tax gas? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, kind of essentially I think a, a, a tax would obviously be a, a policy level type decision. Is it a possibility? Um, you know, I mean, I guess anything's possible. Um, the point is, um, you're right, uh, with, with gas being as low as it is now, 
there's a possibility people might be more willing to to look at a tax um, um, on on uh, gasoline versus you know obviously when we had gas prices at three fifty four dollars so um, so sure it's something that could potentially be possible are there what are the best prospects for funding transit here the sixty four thousand dollar question it, there's talk of it could be a maps tax uh, uh, competing with the penny sales tax for education um, Right. How it's, are we going to do this? Well, it's a tough question. I don't think anybody has the exact answer. Um, I think the, the best answer to that question is it's going to be um, a, a multitude of different sources that would support a regional transit authority. So um, when you look at regional transit um, authorities across the country that have dedicated funding, obviously sales tax is one of those options. That's probably one of the more prevalent options. But, um, you know, I think uh, for us uh, that, that could be an option, um, but I think also some, cert some level of local funding would obviously have to uh, continue in order to support the operations. Um, when you look further than that, um, there's also examples w throughout the country of private-public partnerships, uh, particularly when you look at some of the streetcar lines, the two that come to mind are the streetcar in Detroit and the streetcar in Seattle. Uh, you know, private dollars went into helping support and build those systems. Um, and then you take that a step further and you look for ways to uh, uh, leverage revenues through, for example, naming rights and advertising. Um, I believe it was Cleveland um, and their health line had some real success with naming rights, generating several millions of dollars to help support um, that particular line there in that area. So, you know, again, I don't think we have the exact answer today, but uh, what we need to do, I believe, as a community is decide what does our regional transit system look like? What is it and how much are we trying to pay for? And then let's start talking about all of those options and see which ones make the most sense, because it's going to take more than one. I have a question over here. Yes, I see. I was noticing in your discussion, you said you ran two lines that ran to midnight, and with the success rates of those thus far, they seem pretty good from what I've heard you saying or whatever. How quickly do you think that the other lines will be expanded to the midnight? I know in the criminal justice field, from where I'm speaking, that has helped tremendously in some of the areas for those that have employers um, that have the three shifts to work because that was a huge um, problem that we were running into that they weren't able to get to work and most of them having suspended licenses to try to get those reinstated and not being out on the streets illegally and stuff was such a problem that would be a huge improvement for us and compliance and everything to get those lines to open up and to extend out further yeah the um, enhancing and expanding the night service um, really is our that's our next priority. You know, I've mentioned continuing to work our plan, and one of the recommendations in that transit system analysis was, was night service. And so we began with two routes, and we do believe we've had uh, surprisingly good success um, with those two routes. And I say surprisingly because when you think about it, it's, it's two routes out of 21 with not a whole lot of connection. But what we found is people are using them. Uh, cumulatively, I believe it was maybe October, September, you know, we had 4,500 passenger trips. So, um, you know, that's a pretty, a pretty solid start. So to answer your question, um, we are going to um, expand the, the, the offering of routes that run until midnight uh, beginning January 25th uh, with Route uh, 5 and Route uh, 13. So both of those routes will be running in, until midnight. And, um, and you bring up a really good point, and, and you know, others have, have said it before me, but one of the challenges we've had, um, particularly with people that work shifts, is in the past we've been able to get them to work, but we don't have the service out there to get them home. And so you know, running the buses until midnight solves that problem for people. And I believe, I'm a firm believer in the fact that it contributes to their livelihood and their quality of life when they can pick up those and have more flexibility with the shifts that they work. Question in the back. It's uh, more of a comment, if that's okay. Uh, one of the ways we can address the funding issue is something that the community could take on themselves without going through any type of a vote for increasing taxes, whether it's sales tax or gasoline taxes. 
We have over 45,000 people that work in the downtown area, and we have a very good bus system in place now that it's on a spoke system that'll pick up uh, riders from all parts of the city and take them downtown, you know, on a straight uh, single route. If we had just a third of those individuals who work downtown ride the bus on a regular basis, that would generate 14 to 15 million dollars of additional revenue. That's close to what the city uh, supplements COPTA's budget for. So just overnight, we could begin offering late night services, services out to the airport. We could almost double what the bus system currently provides if the community would begin to say, hey, I want to help this. Uh, I think we're at the point where we can no longer just complain about the service. We have to actually participate in the improvement. And the more people we have riding the bus, the more revenue it'll generate, and that'll just be put back into a more enhanced bus system. Thank you. Ms. Branch, one question for you, fares. Do you think they're reasonable now? Or they, do they discourage people from riding? What's your sense of um, where they stand? I mean, they're not going to go down, I'm sure. No, and, and, and I think that, you know, the point's been made that, you know, the people who really are riding the bus right now are people um, predominantly or relatively low income. I mean, I think we still live in a community that um, those of us who, you know, those people who can drive, drive, and then, you know, the system is still used by, you know, people who are lower income. I mean, I think that we don't, I mean, we don't get a lot of um, of complaints regarding the fares, and I know there's been some fare increases, you know, in the last year or so, and, and I think they were handled pretty well. You know, I do think that we have to recognize that, that public transit is a subsidized um, service and that we have to be mindful of the people who are currently using it and alternative forms of transportation within our community are really not affordable. And so, you know, if we're going to continue to serve the people, you know, that, that we serve and, you know, the, the lady over here mentioned, you know, people coming out of the criminal justice system you know, those people are challenged that really need to work. We, we need to be mindful of that because there really are no other affordable alternatives w within our community. Mr. O'Connor, now, in some cities, there is a lot of subsidy from businesses and from government, county government, state government, to discount fares for their employees. Do we see any, is any of that happening now, or could it, could it happen under an expanded system? I think it could, and... Um you know, I think that those really show just different, that public-private, you know, I think push behind uh, transit that really helps it. Um, a couple things just, just really contextual that really fit with this discussion. I mean, when we talk about passenger fares and even full buses, and if you look nationwide at bus, bus transit systems and bus systems, I mean, typically uh, full buses vary, no matter the size of the system, they're they usually only recover between 15 and 20 percent of what it costs, costs to operate their buses through the fare box. Um, and when you when you think about that, I mean, so the fare is a is an important piece, but really the dedicated funding that is permanent and it's predictable and you know where it's going year after year is very very important to continue the services because the fares alone won't do it. Um, the public private and really I think you know there's some great examples the federal. You know, federal workers have, um, I want to say it's $160 a month that's available to them for either transit passes, no matter where they work. That's the federal government's way of basically helping to support the system, help support ridership, help kind of lessen that burden. Uh, we've seen that, um, you know, in my experience working in Kansas City in the transit industry up there, there were a lot of different public-private. We, we worked with everything from large banks downtown that had limited parking ability. This was a way for them to free up spots, Hallmark, um, universities where, um, and, and you know these places when you, when you think around the metro that uh, very popular destinations that no matter what, 
time it is, there's limited parking. Um, and that there was really not only a win-win as far as supporting the system, but for that employer, for that institution to basically free up some, some parking by going that route. So those things help. Um, and those really help attract new riders to the system, choice riders, um, and you know, really help basically promote and, and uh, build the system. So yeah, good question. question. Question here. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, time. Uh, two two part question. One, what will happen with the current downtown hub when the Santa Fe hub comes online? It, w will there be two, or will it move? And then also, uh, what what could we do to decrease time between uh, arrivals for the bus from 30 to say 20? And uh, would a grid option as opposed to a hub and spoke option ever be? Uh, something that Oklahoma City would, Oklahoma City would see. Did you catch? Did you catch that? I, I missed a little bit of it, but I, it was the intermodal hub. Uh, was it frequency on local bus routes, and then grid versus spoke? Yeah, I was wondering. First of all, I'm I'm not sure what's going to happen. The current downtown hub, will that cease to exist when the Santa Fe hub comes online, or will there be two, or will they oh. not? No, actually there will, there will be two. And so the transit center, or the, the bus hub, will continue to operate as, as it is today with, with all uh, fixed route bus service serving that facility. What the uh, intermodal hub is uh, designed to do at the, at the historic Santa Fe uh, station um, it will serve multiple modes of transportation. So long term, what you're going to see at that intermodal hub is really kind of that transportation center for downtown Oklahoma City. So you'll have local bus service. You'll have the modern streetcar serving that facility when it comes online. Um, we have been in discussions with different motor coach providers um, to try to get, uh, you know, uh, interstate or whatever bus service into the intermodal hub. Um, you'll see things like uh, uh, bike share, for example. Um, obviously, we have Amtrak there. Um, so lots of different modes of transportation will be serving that hub. And then, again, in the context of the regional transit discussion, ultimately, we hope to have commuter rail uh, serve that facility. So, so that's really uh, what the intermodal hub uh, and that project is all about. Definitely not to, not to take away from what the transit center is doing, but just provide another uh, transportation option. And then um, was the other question about improving frequency beyond the 30 minutes that we're on now? Yeah, yeah and, and you know, I, I talked earlier about um, our number one priority at this time being expanding that night service. And, and that still continues to be our priority as we get additional incremental funding. We want to continue to make that night service more robust, but, I, but just, just as important is improving our frequency. Right now, um, almost all of our routes are on 30 minutes. Um, our average frequency prior to our enhancements was anywhere from you know, 40 to 50 minutes, whether you're in peak time or off peak time. So we've really made some strides there, but we do know um, that to improve our transit system, make it even more convenient, make it more appealing, we've got to improve frequency. So high frequency corridors, picking out those segments of different routes where we should be providing 15 minute service, that, that's in our plan too. So if I had to rank some of the more important pieces of our plan and our priorities, I'd say night service, Sunday service, and more high frequency corridors is what we're, what we're looking at. And again, based on you know, different changes in incremental funding. You wanted to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment, too, because, you know, really, um, you know, when Mr. Greenwell mentioned about, you know, improving ridership, um, you really start improving ridership when it becomes a viable option, right, which which means the, the frequency. And, um, Forrest, you mentioned a, a grid, and I know that that's, that's something that has been looked at by um, by the city, and we use a, a hub and spoke. It takes a lot more buses on the ground to operate a grid. And the other challenge here in Oklahoma City is that we're one of the largest cities geographically in the country, and everybody here, you know, who lives anywhere in the metropolitan area, there's an expectation that they're going to get city services and. The reality of it is, and I, I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of what drives 
public transportation and an ability to have a robust system is driven by population density. And we just don't have those densely populated areas. And so I think long term, and I'm just, you know, this is just Lauren Branch talking, I think that that the city's going to have to make, you know, and we as a community are going to have to make some decisions as to um, maybe contracting services in some areas that if you want to live way out on the edge of the metropolitan area, you know what, maybe you don't get service out there, you know, and you start, you know, bringing in like, um, you know, I grew up in Houston when they started transit there, park and rides, and then, you know, the, the systems that connected, you know, more centrally into the city. But the reality of it is, is that you cannot provide these kinds of services in the geographic area that, that we expect them to be and get all of the things that we need to be able to provide the frequency that, that we need, the expanded routes. And I think those are some of the challenges that we have. And, and there's got to be the will to, um, the will in our community to make those changes so that that we can, um, you know, leverage the money into the system to be able to make those improvements. Question here. Hello, I'm Michael Hinton, and I'd like to preface my question is that I have read in the media for the past 20 years, $39 million of Oklahoma taxpayers' money is going to other cities to subsidize their transit system. Senator Jim Inhofe, who happens to be from Oklahoma, has been fighting in Washington for years to bring that money back to Oklahoma to be uh, distributed for tr public transit. And not only that, my uh, talks with the locals is that virtually no one knows about this money being squandered. And that's my own personal opinion. Squandered, and they don't know that their money is being sent out of this state. So to get to the specifics of my question, should there be an educational campaign to alert the locals how their money is being squandered for its public transit, fight to bring that money back to Oklahoma, or should we raise a one cent city sales, sales tax for Oklahoma City that we can subsidize and support public transit? Mr. O'Connor, you want to take that? Question. Um, Sure. So I think a couple, a couple things. I'm not quite sure, ex, you know, as far as what those exact calculations or I mean, when you talk about the, the different uh, all federal federal dollars, but I think really to simplify it, um, when we pay in, basically part of our federal federal taxes that all of us pay goes into a formula at federal DOT or the Department of Transportation. So it's allocated based upon population. So Oklahoma gets a share that comes in for basically a lot of the federal highway funding. There's also a federal transit piece that's based upon population. When there's larger projects that might be transit projects, say, um, I don't know, a, a new light rail line in Dallas, there's competitive uh, grants available at the federal government through federal transit. So the communities that are ready to actualize those federal dollars, they have the plan in place, they have that local funding commitment, and they're able to basically actualize those grants and get a hold of them. And that's, that's really where a lot of this has gone, is that we've paid in, other regions have had their plans in place, their financing in place, and have competitively secured that. So really, we're as a region, we need to go, and as part of one of our funding strategies, there's lots of ways to fund this, but in order to actualize some of that federal funding that's available for transit, whatever mode it is that's there from a competitive standpoint, we need to have local plans and local funding in place, basically ready to go in formal plans. And that, so that's the one, that's where we're behind as a region, that's really where our uh, community leaders and the six cities and you know our partners at uh, Embark and CART and CityLink, all at, at ACOG are really talking about trying to get that regional vision, trying to find those regional projects and to begin you know actualizing on that. 
So the local, it's a combination. We, we're, we need to get next in line by uh, you know, putting our plans together and putting our funding together. Yeah. Thank you. Question. Question here. Um, <clears throat> my name is Nancy Ward, and my question is, <clears throat> When you did the, cha the last transportation change, before that, um, three went down 10th Street, and now it goes down 13th, so are down Phillips, but the, two Phillips. So there is no transportation on 10th Street for me to get to my doctor's office? That's one question. And then my other question is, I want to understand, and I'm not trying to make this sound like I'm attacking, because I just want to understand. Um, on 23rd Street in Classen, there is as you're going outbound, or inbound as the case may be, um, there's a bus stop on both sides of Classen. If you go down to 34th, there is a bus stop there, but the next one is on 29th. And I'm just trying to understand how all that was decided. Okay, um, let me see if I can answer your question about Route 3 first. Um, with the transit system analysis that we implemented, um, we did make, as I've mentioned and as you've mentioned, you know, changes to routes. Some of those routes, some of the changes were more significant than others. And you know, we made those changes based off of recommendations that would improve the system overall. And, and I do regret that any change we made would have made it more difficult for you to get to where you need to go. At the same time, we have to recognize that we have the entire community and we really made those changes on the basis of how do we make the system itself better. And I say that, though, because public feedback was very important to that process. As we were going through those um, changes, I believe it was a total of 14 different public meetings that we held, multiple meetings in all different areas of the city, to go over all of the changes um, with, our, with our customer base. And there was a lot of feedback we received from the community that we did incorporate into those final recommendations. A good example, I believe, is um, Route 22, for example. Um, there was a lot of discussion, you know, does it go um, east out of downtown on, uh, is it Reno or 4th or 8th? Um, you know, there was discussion there, and, and we based that final decision on community feedback. Uh, route 19 was a route that we had originally proposed uh, for elimination because when looking at the rest of the, the bus routes, it was one of the lowest performing routes. But again, based on feedback we received the, from the community, that was the only transportation option that some of the, the community had. So we put that route back in. So, so I hope that kind of, it was a thoroughly vetted process. Um, unfortunately, when you move a route, you're bringing it closer to some people and further away from others. And it's just, that's how it is. But I can, I sincerely say we made those changes in the interest of improving the system overall. Now, in terms of the bus shelters on Classen, and I'm not familiar exactly with the, what each one of those shelters look like, whether they're some of the new shelters that we've added recently, or they're the older shelters that have been around for a while. I would say if they're the older shelters, then, you know, I don't have a good answer for you as to why those shelters were placed where they were. Um, but I can tell you with the shelters that we're installing now, the newer bus shelters, it's really based off of, of 
two or three different criteria. One is ridership, boardings and alightings. We always look through the system to see where are people using the stops most. We have automatic, automatic passenger counters on the bus, so we know where people are getting off and on. That's our primary criteria, but we also look for major shopping centers or healthcare places that might also need shelters. So, You have to make hard choices. I, I want to bring up something related to that. Uh, you get about $1 million from the state, right? Relatively low for, our, uh, for most states. In the meantime, we're about to build a lot of turnpikes. And your agency is about to fancy up and build, add to more parking garages. Isn't this self-defeating in terms of trying to get people to ride buses and trains if we're giving them a lot more parking and a lot more roads? And I'm not necessarily addressing you. Well, uh, anyone can pick up this question. Let me, I, I mean, I, I would be glad to talk about the, the transit system and, and parking dynamic. Um, not as familiar with the, the turnpike question, but um, one thing I think is important for people to understand is that under the Embark umbrella, we do operate parking garages and we do operate a transit system but they are completely separate enterprises. None of the funds are commingled whatsoever. Um, the parking enterprise is standalone um, as well as transit. And, um, you know, we approach um, the two enterprises as not so much how different are they, but where can we, where can we leverage the two different systems to create some synergies? And so what I mean by that is, we feel like, at least at this point, we still have a strong demand for parking downtown. Um, and we want to be able to provide that parking. But the thought is, too, once we get people downtown and into our garages, we want to have a transit system that is frequent, that is robust. People will use that transit system to circulate throughout the downtown area. And I think the modern streetcar is a real good um, answer to that situation and so to me if we can get people to park in our garages jump on a public transit vehicle experience transit realize the benefits that it has to offer um, that you know they aren't necessarily always in competition with each other anyone want to add anything I'll, I'll add you know quickly I'll add a little to turnpike so I, I get that one um, you know, I think what's important to, to keep in mind and, and probably look at really the big picture of lots of things is um, this region, I mean, as mentioned, I mean, we're on some historical growth trajectory. We, we grew 15% in the last decade. We added the size of Edmond in the last decade. That's new development. Um, you know, we at the region are projecting basically a 45% growth here where the region will move from 1.1 million to 1.6 in the next 25 years. This is significant growth. And we are behind, I mean, when you think about our history, we're a younger city. Many of these other regions have been at it. They were settled before us. They were incorporated before us. They were growing before us. Um, but we're really looking at some historic times here. As you travel, and you know, it doesn't matter which major metro you go to, you will notice um, very robust transportation systems, and it's a combination, and it's a combination of highways and turnpikes, transit, regional transit, local transit, um, good streets, streets that, streets that have lots of modes. And really where we need to look at as far as a region, even the, t the turnpikes and, and the transit are not exclusive. I think it's more of an indication as far as where this region is growing, um, that we need multiple options to accommodate the growth, to well serve our current residents, and to design everything as a system. Um, transit needs a good bike and ped network in order to work. Bike, ped, transit, are very important to add choices, uh, transportation choices. And people choose every day um, as far as how they need to get from point A to point B. The more choices that we can provide, um, the healthier our region's gonna be, the, more it's, the better it's gonna be from an economic standpoint. Um, and so I think, you know, I just encourage you to, to think of that. Um, many major metros, I mean, they have, you know, they have their outer loops. 
They have their very robust transit systems. I think it's, I think we're on some historic footing right now as far as where we're going. Ms. Branch, about the streetcar, for the populations in need in Oklahoma City, how do they perceive the streetcar and what use it will be to, to them or to the city as a whole? Um, you know, the, the streetcar is interesting because, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, for our, you know, for our region to start, you know, it was actually um, the impetus really for us to really start having a conversation about improving public transit. I, th I think the reality of it is, is, is um, you know, I mean, I'm excited to see it. I think that, you know, getting around downtown is going to be a lot easier. I think for for a lot of people, um, the the challenge is, I mean, for the people that we serve, it's probably not going to be, um, I mean, it's not going to be a lot of benefit, you know, because you have to be able to, you have to have feeders in and feeders out, you know, to, and, and I think that, you know, we needed to do something, um, you know, shiny and sleek you know, for our community to really see what public transit could look like. I, I think that we need to continue to be aware that we don't want, that we don't want it to become a, a shiny train that circulates downtown, you know, in downtown Oklahoma City. And, you know, if it's going to be something that's really going to be useful, then we have to build and we have to be able to invest in the infrastructure that goes around it. And, and mass transit systems, good robust mass transit systems, the infrastructure is in the rubber tire connectivity. And, and that's not the sexy shiny ball out there that, that a lot of people want and we're trying to sell, but that really is the foundation to make something like that work. The, the streetcar is not going to support itself on people going to lunch downtown or, or tourists going from one point to the next. It really is about um, having a, an infrastructure around it that feeds people into it and, and feeds people out. And, and transit is really supported primarily by people who, who work. I mean, it's really getting to and from work. And, and the other is, is kind of ancillary. So um, I I would challenge us to to be cognizant of that and and to make sure that that we're thinking long term so that our entire community can benefit from the investment that we're making in the streetcar. Thank you. There's a question here. Behind. Thank you, Oklahoma Watch, for all you do and for putting this forum together. And thank you all there on the stage for your willingness to put up with uh, our our various comments and questions. Some of them will be better than others, and I would say, I would speak for everybody, that many of us are available to volunteer for public comment on various things and various actions that you take. Um, thank you for the mention of park and ride. I was wondering whether I was going to be the first one to mention that. I live 20 miles away, and I sure would like to take a vacation somewhere in the world and not have to come back and pay $100 bill to pay for my parking. I'd lot rather give it to you for a park and ride from Edmond. Number three, um, or well, I guess I'm to number four already. I want to talk a little bit about hardware and the things you buy for public transit in the future. I've had the good fortune to visit Switzerland to see a bus that would kneel down and had such a low floor that I don't think you could have rolled a flashlight under that first step. And that first step was the floor. There's good hardware out there, and I'm not so sure that we're actually up to speed with all the changes and all the dynamism that 2015 represents. The changing fuel systems to power the various vehicles, uh, uh -oh. the different ways that, that uh, hybrid buses, which are available, they're being used in uh, electric buses, are being used in Kings Canyon public education uh, transportation in uh, San Joaquin Valley. So your, uh, sir, your question would be, are we up to date, or do we have any plans are we to get looking, up to date on our technology we, and our transit system? Are we looking widely in terms of the bus that might last 20 or 40 years, but it's not like buying a diesel, buying the best one in 1970, 
It has to be something that might have a different kind of fuel system in just 10 to 15 years. I'll, I'll try to take that one and, and let you know from Embark's perspective kind of what we're looking at in terms of technology, hardware. Um, I think I'd start, you know, your comment on kneeling buses, and I'm not familiar with one that kneels as low as what you've described, but I, I can say that um, our buses do kneel. Um, they are um, obviously ADA accessible. One of the things that we've done is equipped a lot of our buses with um, what you call a Q-strength system. Um, if you're familiar at all with that, it's essentially a, it's the, the leading uh, wheelchair securement device in the industry. Um, in terms of other hardware that's on the buses, we've implemented um, AVL technology, so all of our buses have automatic vehicle locators. So what does that do? That helps us be able to manage our system uh, very uh, efficiently from, you know, basically a computer screen. Doesn't take the place of supervisors on the street. We haven't tried to do that, but it does help us have some advantages there. In terms of customer service, the AVL technology allows um, mobile trip planning. It allows um, anybody that uses our service the ability to receive text alerts with real-time um, estimated um, arrivals of the next bus. Um, and I think we've talked about the Wi-Fi. So that's kind of some of the hardware um, that we're putting on our buses. You'll notice all of our buses now have flashers um, on, the, on the back of them, and that's an additional uh, safety uh, enhancement that we made to try to draw attention to people that when we're stopping, we're stopped. Um, so we do a lot of those kinds of things in terms of hardware. Uh, fuel technology, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we actually, within our fleet now of 59 buses, we've tried some different fuel technologies. We currently run a diesel hybrid bus. So we've experimented with that technology. Um, it's been uh, fairly successful. Um, in fact, I'd say it has been very successful. Um, we are actually um, looking to purchase an additional hybrid bus as we speak. I believe we have a, a bid on the street. I'm looking for quotes for that now. Um, and then uh, other fuel technologies. Um, CNG is what we're looking at now uh, predominantly for the for the, the most of most of our fleet our cop the board of trustees has given staff direction to begin making uh, plans and arrangements to convert our um, fleet to CNG technology I know um, that's something that's been talked about within the community for several years it obviously supports um, Oklahoma and some of the industry that we have here it's a much quieter running bus it's a cleaner uh, bus for the environment so we are making strides um, in converting our fleet to CNG. Um, in fact, our next bus order uh, will be CNG buses. And then you mentioned electric buses, and electric buses is something that we have looked at. We would like to be able to leverage. Obviously, they're very expensive. The range on some of the electric buses is a little bit limited, but where I do think an electric bus would, would work really well is in the downtown area because we have a more confined range. We can recharge it. Uh, in order for that to happen, and because of the price of the electric buses, probably what we would have to look for is a specialized competitive grant issued by the FTA, a low or no low uh, type grant that would allow us to be able to purchase that technology. So it's a great question um, and something that we are looking into. And I think right now we're most excited about uh, converting over to CNG. A question, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, are we going to build HOV lanes on I-35, 77? Wasn't that in the original plan? I believe it was. There was some, I think, you know, everything, I think we have to look at everything. There's no, there's no official plan. Um, and for those of you who aren't, aren't familiar with HOV lanes, these are carpool lanes. They're, you might see them in other metros as diamond lanes. More than one person in the vehicle gives you that left lane, or unless you're an emergency vehicle or transit vehicle, et cetera. I think there's lots of different options that are not very capital intensive, but could provide um, really a benefit to those who carpool, those who use transit. We've seen examples in other metros where um, buses are allowed to use the shoulder on a highway to basically bypass, stop, traffic that stopped. Um, so I think, you know, all of it we need to look at. This is really trying to get a comprehensive plan that, that has 
all the right solutions for the right context, you know, and there's different contexts and there's different scenarios and there's different design requirements everywhere you look. And, um, you know, I think that, that should be part of the mix for sure. So. I want to thank you all for coming. Our guests will be here for a few minutes afterward if you want to catch them with a question. Uh, again, please check out OklahomaWatch.org. And um, I'm sure they'd, be, they'd welcome any input by email or any other appropriate way on your thoughts on transit and what should be done. Thanks again. Thank you.